Amazing Magnetism. Introduction. My name is Carlos. I am one of the kids in Miss Frizzle's class. Maybe you have heard of Miss Frizzle. Sometimes we just call her the Frizz. She is a terrific teacher, but strange. One of her favorite subjects is science, and she knows everything about it. She takes us on lots of field trips in the magic school bus. Believe me, it's not called magic for nothing. We never know what's going to happen when we get on that bus. Miss Frizzle likes to surprise us, but we can usually tell when she is planning a special lesson. We just look at what she's wearing. One day she came into class wearing a dress covered in with what looked like a bunch of horseshoes. But when I looked closer, I realized they were horseshoe magnets. That was how I knew we were about to study magnetism. Little did we know how many different things magnets do. We discovered they're everywhere, but let me start from the beginning. Chapter one. I was running through the hallway to get to Miss Frizzle's classroom. We were starting a new study unit and I couldn't wait to find out what it was. But as I rounded the corner, I ran straight into something. I hit it with such a thud that I fell backward. Ouch! As I landed, I felt a button pop off my shirt and I saw it roll away. I went to grab the button, but then I stopped. Sitting on the floor facing me was Andrew Cochran, my least favorite person. Now I knew what, actually who, I ran into. I couldn't believe my bad luck. Andrew was Mr. O'Neatley's star pupil. Mr. O'Neatley was the other third grade teacher. He and Miss Frizzle sometimes shared study units together. Last month we had a spelling bee. I didn't like to think too much about it. Because of me, our class lost. And because of Andrew, Mr. O'Neatley's class had won. He correctly spelled the word that I'd missed, attraction. Watch where you're going, Andrew said as he started picking up his books. The one on top had a big picture of a horseshoe on it and the title was All About Magnets. Sorry, I mumbled as I scrambled to my feet. I slung my backpack over my shoulder and started towards class. I didn't even stop to look for the missing button. Andrew liked to remind me of his spelling bee victory almost every day, and I wanted to get away before he had a chance to tell me again. I wasn't fast enough. We're going to beat you again, he called as I ran off. I wondered what he meant. I sure hoped we weren't having another spelling. When I got into class, I saw that the geography signs from our last unit were still up. Over Miss Frizzle's desk was a big sign that read West. Over the windows was a sign that read North. And behind me was a sign that read East. Over the door, the sign read South but I noticed that Miss Frizzle wasn't wearing her map dress anymore. Her new dress was covered with the same horseshoe shapes as Andrew's book. Good morning, class, she sang out. Today, we are going to start a most attractive unit. Oh no, that reminded me of the word attraction again. Miss Frizzle held up a large horseshoe magnet. It wasn't hard to guess that our new unit was going to be about magnetism. Then we noticed that on everyone's desk was a little box with stuff in it. A bumpy rock, a rubber band, a plastic checker piece, some paper clips, a piece of paper, a nail, a penny, and a black rectangular bar magnet. This will be easy, Carlos, Wanda whispered. All we have to do is pick up things with magnets. Yeah, I whispered back, nothing to it. We should have known better. When was anything straightforward in Miss Frizzle's class? I looked around the room. Some of the other kids had chains of paper clips hanging from their magnets. Others were trying to pick up stuff like paper and rubber bands, but it wasn't working, of course. Anyone who kn knows magnets only pick up metal things. 
class, said Miss Frizzle with a big smile. Mr. O'Neatly and I thought the best way to learn about magnets would be to have a little contest. Everyone groaned. Mr. O'Neatly's class always be us. Our class lost the spelling bee. The kickball tournament? Tournament? the pumpkin pie baking contest and the summer readathon. No wonder Andrew was smug. Don't worry kids, said the frizz. If there's one thing our class can do well, it's science. And this is a science scavenger hunt. It's our turn to show our science stuff. Yeah, we'll leave them behind this time, I said, thinking of beating Andrew. Take out the piece of paper in your box, Miss Frizzle said, and we can begin the science scavenger hunt. On the paper was a list of riddles. They must be the scavenger hunt clues, I thought. Whichever class fills out the list first wins a pizza party. The winner is the class that brings the completed list to the science lab first, said the Frizz. She didn't have to say another word. We all had our lists out and were busily reading. I read the first riddle. Scavenger hunt question number one. A magnet picks me up. A magnet holds me high. I'm not paper, wood, or rubber. I'm not plastic. What am I? What's that supposed to mean? Phoebe asked. It's asking what's attracted to magnets, said Tim. That's easy. It's metal. Oh yeah, said Ralphie. What about the penny? It's metal. And look, the magnet can't pick it up at all. He held his penny next to the magnet, let go, and the penny clinked to the floor. Hmm, I said, feeling stumped. I worried that Andrew had found the answer to the riddle already. Then we noticed Dorothy Ann flipping through the pages of a book. It was the same as Andrew's, all about magnets. D.A. always seemed to have a book, and she usually knew a lot about our new science units before everyone else. Here's the answer, she said, reading from the book. Magnets attract only a certain kind of metal. From all about magnets, magnet metals. Magnets are only attracted to metals. Metals that contain iron and steel attract magnets well. Metals like brass, copper, zinc, and aluminum are not attracted to magnets. So, magnets don't attract copper, Tim said. That's why the penny didn't stick. Yes, said D.A., still reading from the book. Pennies are made of copper-coated zinc. I'll write down the answers as we find them, I said. I wanted to make sure the answers were written down correctly. This was one race we weren't going to lose to Mr. O'Neatley's class if I had anything to do with it. I whisked out my pen and wrote, Metals that contain iron and steel stick to magnets. That was the answer to number one. Only nine more to go. I could already taste the pizza. Chapter two. Arnold was playing with the contents of his box. Just as I finished writing the answer, he said, hey, my paper clips are sticking to this bumpy old rock. I quickly took the paper clip on my desk and held it against the rock. It stuck. What's going on, Miss Frizzle? I asked. Well, you know that iron and steel stick to magnets, so what does that tell you about the rock? Asked Miss Frizzle. It's a magnet, said Wanda. It doesn't look like one. But it acts like one, said Keisha. That's right, and when we do experiments, we have to trust our observations, said the Frizz. So these old rocks are magnets? Asked Tim. What does your book say, D.A.? D.A. found a picture of one of our rocks in the book from all about magnets. Magnetite is a natural magnet. People first found out about magnetism when they discovered the magnetic power of these rocks. And look at the second question of the scavenger hunt, I said. Scavenger hunt question number two. We look the same as rocks, but we don't act the same. We are natural magnets. Can you guess our name? As I finished reading, Phoebe said, magnetic rocks, the rocks on our table. Yeah, said Tim, so the answer to the riddle is magnetite. I carefully picked up the scavenger hunt list and wrote down, magnetite is a rock that is a natural magnet. History of Magnets by Wanda. The first people to discover magnetic rocks were the Chinese. They called it the loving stone because the stones love metal the way parents love children. At first, the Chinese used the stones to perform fortune telling and magic tricks. 
Later, they used the loving stones to invent the compass, hundreds of years before the Europeans. I carefully folded the scavenger list and put it in my pocket. I had a good feeling about this. We already had two answers. We might even beat Mr. O'Neatley and Andrew this time. Chapter 3 it's time to get serious. Follow me to the science lab, said the frizz. Mr. O'Neatley and I have set up some experiments to help us find the answers. Bring your magnetic kits with you. Then Miss Frizzle picked up a fancy remote control box with a picture of the magic school bus on it, gave it a little pat, put it in a bag, and slung it over her shoulder. We looked at one another. What was our teacher doing with the remote control? The frizz always had a plan. We passed Mr. O'Neatley's class on the way to the lab. His classroom was right next door to ours. Now we pretended not to look, but I know, I know I wasn't the only one who took a peek. Mr. O'Neatley's students were still hanging paper clips from the magnets. We were ahead. We went around two corners to the lab. Miss Frizzle told us to get a partner and go to a table. Arnold and I headed for a table set up with a large bar magnet and some needles. Miss Frizzle rummaged in her bag for something. Now where are those iron filings? I thought I put them in here. She unloaded a few things from her back, including the fancy remote control with a picture of the magic school bus on it. Then she shook her head and looked around the room. What do they look like? I asked, looking around the lab. Iron filings are small pieces of iron, like tiny pins. They are perfect for experiments. Ah, here's a brand new box of iron filings. She picked up a box off the center table, opened it, and shook out a bunch of small metal pieces. Each of us took a small handful and put them on our tables. First of all, stroke the needles from your kits with the magnet and see what happens, said the frizz. I could see Wanda at the next table. She stroked the needle against the magnet and put it down on the table. As soon as she set it down, all the iron filings near the needle flew toward it and stuck. The needle turned into a magnet, I said. Carlos, ours isn't working, said Arnold. The frizz came over and looked. You have to stroke it in only one direction, Arnold, she said. Miss Frizzle stroked our needle against a large magnet. You see, anything with iron in it can be magnetized. She picked up several iron filings with our needle and handed it to us. Then it becomes a temporary magnet. Wow, I said, that's so cool. I took the magnetized needle and used it to pin my shirt together where the buttons have popped off. That's another way to use the magnet to stick things together, I whispered to Arnold. My mind had started to wander, but Arnold poked me and said, Wake up, Carlos. We have to know this stuff to win the contest. He was right. I didn't want to miss the next question. Not when we were in the lead. I read the next question. Scavenger hunt question number three. Not all magnets start on the ground. Not all magnets have to be... When you do this very easy chore, you can use one magnet to make many more. What's the chore, kids? asked Miss Frizzle. It's what we did to make the needles into magnets, said Keisha. Right, I said, and I know what to write. I took out the scavenger list and wrote very carefully. If you stroke a needle with a magnet in one direction, the needle will become a magnet. But that wasn't enough for DA. She had to know more. What's happening inside the needle? She asked, why does it attract the iron filings? That got Miss Frizzle started. Did I say this magnet stuff was going to be easy? Well, I was wrong. Let's find out, being the frizz. As I always say, to understand an iron filing, you have to become an iron filing. Arnold moaned. Can't DA just read to us from her book some more? He asked in a small voice. I noticed that Arnold's voice was getting smaller and smaller as he spoke, and I felt myself shrinking. Whoa, I said. I looked down at myself and at the others. We were all iron filings. We were super small. Even the frizz was tiny. We still had heads and arms and legs, but our bodies were made of metal. Now, Liz will walk around with a magnet and you can all see what it feels like to be attractive. 
At that moment, Liz, who was still her normal size, dropped the large magnet she was carrying and scampered under the center table. What's wrong, Liz? said Miss Rizzle, but then she stopped. We all heard it at the same time. Footsteps and voices. It was Mr. O'Neatley and his class. As they came through the door, I groaned. Andrew was right behind Mr. O'Neatley. They all looked enormous from the point of view of an iron filing. Don't worry, class, said the frizz. She was holding the fancy remote control. I'm calling the magic school bus here to rescue us. Then she pushed a button with a picture of the bus on it. It'll be here in a jiffy. We could hear Mr. O'Neatley's voice booming above us. Yes, Andrew, part of a good science is preparing your materials in advance, Mr. O'Neatley was saying. He stopped walking. Look at the state of this place. What happened, he said indignantly. All of our magnetic kits were still spread over the lab tables. I can't bear a messy lab. It was perfectly clean this morning. As I left a box of brand new iron filings right here on the table. Mr. O'Neatley stopped and looked at the empty table where Miss Frizz had unloaded her bag. Oops, I could pretty much guess what happened. Miss Frizzle had taken Mr. O'Neatley's box of filings. Now where could they have gone? Mr. O'Neatley stomped around the table, peering underneath it. His footsteps shook the floor and made us vibrate. We huddled together on the floor. Mr. O'Neatley, there are some iron filings on the floor, said Andrew eagerly, pointing down to at us. Andrew leaned toward us. At that moment, I saw the miniature magic school bus pop out of a vent in the wall behind Andrew. It was moving fast. Hurry up, hurry up, I said to myself. The bus was speeding toward us, but it had to cross the whole lab. Very well, said Mr. O'Neatley. Someone must have spilled them. The bus was almost in front of us when Mr. O'Neatley kneeled down. The magic school bus ran up against Mr. O'Neatley's shoe just as he swept us all into his hand. Whoa, I yelled, at his, I yelled as his giant hand closed around us. Hey, look at this, said Andrew, pointing to the magic school bus. Mr. O'Neatley sighed. Leaving toys on the floor is a terrible habit. I dislike having to clean up after a certain other class all the time. He leaned back down and with his other hand scooped up the magic school bus. All of you can take a seat and stroke your needles with a magnet, as I explained. The class of giants moving moved toward magnetic kits. Be sure to stroke in one direction, he called out. With a sinking heart, I realized they were catching up to us while we were stuck in Mr. O'Neatley's hand. But then things got worse. You see, class, he said, anything with iron or steel in it can be magnetized, like this toy. Notice that I am stroking it with this magnet. Now it's a magnet too, and it will stick to the refrigerator. I couldn't believe Mr. O'Neatley turned our escape vehicle into a refrigerator magnet. Being around Mr. O'Neatley's class was always bad luck, and I could tell Andrew was working hard to win the scavenger hunt. But Mr. O'Neatley, said Andrew, why does it become a magnet? That's just what I wanted to know, whispered Dorothy Ann. Why don't you consult the book, Andrew, said Mr. O'Neatley. He looked pleased that Andrew had asked such an intelligent question. Andrew flipped through All About Magnets and found the right page. From All About Magnets, what's inside a magnet? A piece of iron or steel contains atoms. Each atom has electrons dancing around the center. The way the electrons dance is called the atom's domain. In magnets, the domains all point in the same direction. In things that aren't magnets, the domains point in different directions. This is not a magnet. The domains are not lined up. This is a magnet. The domains are lined up. So class, Mr. O'Neatley said, when the needle is stroked with a magnet, the magnet's force makes its domains line up. Then the needle is a magnet too. I couldn't follow Mr. O'Neatley at all. Our chances for the scavenger hunt weren't looking good. Chapter four. From the inside of Mr. O'Neatley's hand, we heard his muffled voice. Okay, class, Mr. O'Neatley said as he dumped us on the table. Now that you've all magnetized your needles, Andrew's going to help me demonstrate what the shape of a magnetic field looks like. Gather round. Mr. O'Neatley's class gathered in a circle around us. They looked awfully big and scary, staring down at us. Class, watch carefully as Andrew spreads the iron filings out on a piece of paper. By noticing where the filings go, you will see where the magnet creates a magnetic field said Mr. O'Neatley. He poured us into Andrew's outstretched hands. 
Be careful not to touch any of the iron filings to the magnet, said Mr. O'Neatly. Those filings are so small, you might never get them off. Now I was really worried. We were at Andrew's mercy. Magnetic Field Trip by Mr. O'Neatly. The field of force around a magnet is called a magnetic field. An object within this area will be pulled toward the magnet. The field is strongest at the ends of a magnet and weakest in the middle. You can see the shape of a magnetic field by placing iron filings on a piece of paper over a magnet. The iron filings will be drawn to the magnet in the shape of the magnetic field. Andrew tossed us onto a piece of paper and held a bar magnet underneath us. Whoa! We all yelled as we suddenly got pushed and pulled around. I tried to stay where I was because I wanted to keep Mr. O'Neatley's class from getting the answer, but the pull was irresistible. It felt like something was pulling me by my head and my feet at the same time. I wasn't and it wasn't just that I was moving. My inside seemed to be turning around. It was worse than the wildest roller coaster I'd ever been on. Oh, groaned Arnold. Why is my stomach swirling around? Your domains are lining up with the magnetic field, said Miss Frizzle from the other side of the magnet. My what? asked Arnold. Your domains, the parts of your iron filing body that make you magnetic. In most things, the domains face in all directions but the domains in iron and steel are different. When iron and steel are exposed to a magnet, the magnets pull forces the domains to all line up the same way, said the frizz in her science class voice. That's how magnets attract metals. Great, said Arnold, but it still makes me nauseous. I feel like my insides are twisting. That's exactly what's happening, said the frizz with great excitement. Everyone was complaining about how it felt when the domains were lining up. Ralphie said it was worse than a broken leg. Keisha said it just tickled. Then I overheard what Mr. O'Neatley was saying to this class. It was obvious that they were quickly catching up, and that made me feel sick all over again. My body had already turned into iron, then it was practically turned inside out as my domains were lined up. What else would we have to do to win the scavenger hunt? I was exhausted, but DA still had plenty of questions. But how do we know the electrons are lined up? Asked DA. Well, scientists can't see electrons in even the most powerful microscope, said the frizz. But if I push this button, she said as she moved her thumb, we can see the electrons. She looked down at our bodies. Rows of blue lights were blinking on and off. What's that? I asked. I lit up all the electrons in the room, said the frizz. I looked around. They were blinking blue lights everywhere, but the lights were only in straight rows inside of us and inside the magnet. Your electrons are lined up and pulling together. If you look around, you'll see that in all the non-magnetic materials in the room, the electrons are just scattered. Cool. Now we can answer number four, said Ralphie, who was holding his scavenger list with his free hand. Scavenger hunt question four. When a magnet is in close range, the inside of some metals will change. The domains all turn to point the same way, and while the magnet is close, that's how they'll stay. As soon as I can get my writing hand free of this magnetic field, I'll write it down, I said. My left hand was at the very edge of the field and I pulled it away with all my strength and wrote, when iron or steel is exposed to the magnetic field of a magnet, its domains line up. Mr. O'Neatley was pointing at us. Now you can see what a magnetic field looks like. The iron filings create a swirl pattern that shows us the magnet's pull. There are more filings next to the ends of the magnet and fewer in the middle. That's because the pole is strongest next to the ends or poles of the magnet and weaker in the middle. The field makes a circle around the bar magnet. I could see all of Mr. O'Neatley's kids writing down what he said. Any questions? No, sir, the class said in unison. Next, we'll learn why magnets attract metal, said Mr. O'Neatley. Great, we had already learned that, but as long as we were iron filings, we'd be helping Mr. O'Neatley's class students learn more about magnets. We had to escape. 
Okay class, said Mr. O neatly, now we're going to watch a videotape that will explain about magnetic domains. I wish we could have just learned about domains from a videotape, I whispered to Arnold. So does my stomach, Arnold whispered back. His face was still green. I was glad that I knew about ordered domains, but I was tired of being an iron filing. At that moment, I saw Liz, who was still her normal size. She was crawling cautiously to the front of the classroom. She was carrying a big horseshoe magnet. If Liz can just crawl to the front of the class, said the Frizz, maybe she can attract us with her magnet, and then she can run off with us. Her magnet is bigger than the one under this paper and should be much stronger, the Frizz explained. Let's watch for an opportunity. At that moment, the lights went out and Andrew moved the cardboard away from his bar magnet. He then he set us down on a desk, far from the magnet. We were free of its force. Now, class, join hands and make a chain since it's dark. I want to be ready when Liz comes. We need to make sure all we go, we all go together, said Miss Frizzle. I reached out and tried to grab Arnold's hand and suddenly he reached over for me. Ah, shit. Chapter six. Everybody here, Miss Frizzle's voice called out in the darkness. She did a roll call and everybody answered. A chew, a chew, a chew. We were in the dirt bag of the sweeper and it was dusty in there. I felt for Arnold, but we were no longer attached. The force of the sweeper must have jumbled up our domains and we weren't magnetic anymore. We'll never win now, shouted Arnold above the roar of the vacuum. Why a Temporary Magnet is Temporary by Ralphie When a piece of iron is exposed to a magnet, its domains line up in the same direction. If a paperclip is turned into a temporary magnet, its domains have been lined up. If you bump a paperclip or needle against the table, it rejumbles the domains. Then the paperclip is no longer a magnet. Heating up a temporary magnet will also jumble its domains, so it loses its magnetic pull. You never know, came the frizz's voice from somewhere in the dark. Miss Frizzle is right. We may make a sweeping discovery, I said. Carlos groaned the class as usual. We need the remote, said Miss Frizzle. Has anyone seen my bag? We hadn't seen anything since we'd been in the vacuum cleaner. It was too dark, but I felt something lumpy under me. At first, I thought it was Arnold, but it was the bag. I found it, I yelled. Good work, Carlos, said the frizz. Can you reach in and turn on the remote? My hand located the remote and I flicked the switch. The whole place filled with light. Thank goodness, I said, feeling relieved as I saw everyone's dusty faces. Miss Frizzle cleared her throat. I had the feeling she was getting ready to ask a teacherly question, and I was right. Who knows what Mr. O'Neatly meant about the sweeper being run with magnets, she asked. No one knew the answer. Well then, we'll just have to take a look, said our teacher. Follow me, class. We ran after Miss Frizzle. Whenever, wherever she was going had to be better than this dusty place. The sound of the motor got louder and louder. Miss Frizzle slipped into a crevice and we were right behind her. We were inside the sleeper's motor. Something in the middle was spinning around so fast we couldn't see anything but a blur. We flattened ourselves against the walls. We didn't want to get caught up in that whirling thing. I looked down at the remote and saw a button marked slow. Without thinking, I punched it. Gradually, the whirling crawled to a slow pace. The roaring sound got a lot quieter, and we could see the motor's parts. We even thought we saw magnets. All wrapped up by Keisha. If you wrap a coil of wire around an iron bar and then send an energy through the wire, the iron bar becomes a powerful magnet called an electromagnet. Sure enough, there were two electromagnets in the motor. One was attached to a part that did not move. The other was attached to a part in the middle that was spinning run slowly around from all about magnets, moving and non-moving parts. A simple motor basically has two parts. One does not move. This is called the stator. The other spins or rotates. This is the rotor. Remember how the poles of magnets attach and re attract and repel each other? Asked Miss Frizzle. Yes, north poles move, push 
other North Poles away from themselves, but they pull South Poles towards themselves, said Wanda. Magnets can make each other move, said Phoebe. Is that how magnetism makes the rotor turn? asked Tim. This, that must be how it works, Tim, said D.A., reading the book. It says here that the north pole of the stator magnet pushes away the north pole of the rotor magnet, and then it pulls the rotor's south pole toward itself. That starts the rotor going around, said Ralphie. But wouldn't the rotor just stop once the opposite poles were facing each other, asked Keisha. That's what alternating current is for, said the first. It keeps the rotor turning. So that's the answer to number six, shouted Wanda. Scavenger hunt question number six. These magnets work with electric power. You can turn them off and on. They make a motor run for hours, but with no electricity, their power is gone. From all about magnets, changing direction. The electric current in the wires in our houses is called alternating current, or AC for short. This means that it changes directions many times each second. Every time the current changes, it changes the pole in the electromagnets. The north pole becomes south and the south pole becomes north. The changes keep the rotor moving. Just when the rotor has stopped with its south pole stuck to the stator's north pole, the poles change. Now the stator's north is south, so it pushes the rotor's south pole away again. The changes to the stator's poles keep the rotor going around and around. It's obvious, I said, and wrote, I wrote, the kind of magnet that uses electric current and creates motors is an electromagnet. For a while, we watched the rotor turning. It looked pretty cool spinning like that. Then I wondered about something. But how does the spinning rotor make a sweeper pick up dirt? I asked Miss Frizzle. Let's go see, she said, and she took off again. We jumped up and followed. The rotor was attached to a metal bar called a shaft. The shaft ran outside the motor and was attached to a fan. See, the turning of the rotor makes the blades of the fan turn, said Miss Frizzle. I get it, said Arnold. The fan pulls air into the vacuum bag. We could feel a gentle breeze blowing into the sweeper. And when the air comes in, dirt and dust come in with it, said Wanda. Motes of dust dance in the breeze. Miss Frizzle reached over and took the remote. She pushed a button that said fast. Uh-oh, we heard the roar of the motor again and the gentle breeze became a hurricane. We were swept in the dirt bag again. Achoo! Then, just as suddenly, we heard a click. The roar stopped and the wind died. Mr. Broom must have turned off the vacuum cleaner. Whoa! yelled everyone as we were suddenly lifted up. We slid backward and poured out of an opening. Mr. Broom was emptying the dirt bag. Help! yelled Tim. A strong force was pulling us. I tried to stop, but I couldn't. The force wasn't magnetism, and it wasn't suction. It was plain old gravity. We were falling. Chapter 7 With a soft thump, our fall ended. I could smell leftovers from yesterday's lunch. Stay calm, class, the frizz called. We've hit bottom. Yes, the bottom of the trash can, I called out. Carlos, is that you? Do you still have the remote? asked Miss Frizzle. Got it, I called back. Now press the button with the picture of a little person on it. I looked at the remote. There were all sorts of interesting buttons with interesting pictures, but I figured now was not the time to experiment. I found the button with the picture of the person and pressed it. I looked down and my arms and legs were attached to my normal body again. I looked around and could see Keisha and Wanda standing up and brushing themselves off. Then I saw the frizz and the rest of the class. They were back to their own shapes, but were still miniature. We ran toward one another and Miss Frizzle took her satchel off her shoulder. No more Iron Man for me, I said. First order of business is to get out of this trash chute before Mr. Broom empties it into a dumpster. Quick, put these on. The frizz t was taking some half boots out of her bag. They were toes only, with a bar magnet attached to the front. The individual boots buckled right over the front of our shoes. They weren't that heavy. Then the frizz took out some gloves with the same metal bar attached to the front. We all began putting the boots and gloves on. These are grippers, said the frizz. The bottoms are equipped with strong magnets. 
I had my boots on. I tried to lift my foot and nearly fell over. It was sticking to the metal bottom of the shoe. You need to peel your foot off slowly, sideways, the frizz explained. That's when I noticed that the sides of the grippers were curved. I could roll the gripper off the metal to break its hold. How are these boots and gloves going to help us? asked Tim. Gripping Technology by Arnold. Grippers allow workers to scale offshore oil rigs, bridges, towers, and steel girders in construction sites. Each gripper weighs only 1.5 pounds, but provides 500 pounds of attractive force or more to a steel surface. The curved sides help you rock the gripper away from the wall to move it. Just watch and learn, the frizz called out. With a clang, she reached the edge of the floor, put one foot up on the metal wall, and began walking straight up the steep slope. We were just getting used to walking in the grippers when we heard an awful grating sound. The top of the trash chute opened up, and more garbage began tumbling down the chute. He's emptying the garbage, screamed Phoebe. Run before we get buried. We all began shakily moving across the floor. We all were waving our arms in crazy circles to keep our balance. One by one, we made it to the wall of the chute and started walking straight up. It was hard work. It was such hard work that about half way up, we reached a little ledge and the frizz called a halt. I leaned against the wall and took out the scavenger hunt list. Hey, I said, I think I see another answer. Scavenger hunt question number seven. Magnets can run motors, but you know that is not all. With these special boots and gloves, they help workers climb the wall. I wrote down, workers climb steel walls wearing industrial grippers. Only three more questions to go. I was so excited, I felt my energy come back. Let's keep going, guys, I said. We don't want to throw this opportunity away with the garbage. We began climbing up the rest of the trash chute. Phoebe was the last person out. We sat on the floor, took off our boots, and handed them to the frizz. She somehow crammed them all in her bag. My legs and arms felt like I'd been playing kickball all day. We were all lying on the ground, rubbing our legs and arms too. We don't want to sit here collecting dust, said the frizz. Up class, we've got to win the race. We painfully got to our feet. Chapter eight. We looked to the right. We could we looked Chapter eight. We looked to the right. We looked to the left. We were so small we could only see endless walls. Does anyone remember where the trash chute is in relation to our classroom? asked the Frizz. We all looked blank. You're saying we're lost, Miss Frizzle, said Ralphie. Well, let's just say it would help if we knew if our classroom was on the north side of the school building or the south side. Miss Frizzle replied, we were all silent. Then we may be lost, said the Frizz. We started to panic when I thought of something. Hey, remember the signs on the walls of our room? The ones left over from our geography unit? They said north, south, east, and west. That's right, Carlos, said Dorothy Ann. The one over Miss Frizzle's desk was west, and the windows were north, said Tim. Since our room is at the end of the hall, our room must be in the northwest part of the school, said Arnold. He looked really excited. Good calculating class, said the Frizz. But how does that help us? I asked. Arnold's smile disappeared. He started thinking. If we had a compass, we could find out which way is northwest and go there, he said, smiling again. But we don't have a compass, I pointed out. Arnold's smile went away again. I know, said D.A., we can build our own compass. Miss Frizzle had a cup and cork, but no magnetized needle. We needed all three to make a compass. Something was pricking in the back of my mind. Suddenly, I remembered. I've got one, I shouted. I pinned my shirt closed with my magnetized needle. I carefully pulled it out of the buttonhole. I knew if I shook it, the domains might resettle and the magnetism would be gone. Good work, Carlos. I always said you were a sharp one. I'll fill the cup with water, said Keisha. She ran to the drinking fountain. There was luckily a leak coming out the bottom. Keisha filled the cup and ran back. Miss Frizzle handed Keisha the cork and the needle. 
Keisha floated the flat disc of cork on top of the water. She then carefully set my needle on the cork. It spun around a little and then finally pointed down the hall. Aha, said the frizz, the needle will always point north-south because it follows the line of Earth's magnetic field. Wow, said Ralphie, magnets really are everywhere. Even Earth is a magnet. That's exactly right, said the frizz. Now, we know our class is on the north side of the building, and I know that the trash chute is on the south side. The base of the needle is pointing at the trash chute, so the tip must be pointed north. Follow that needle. And now we have the answer to number eight, said Phoebe. The Magnetic Planet Earth by Carlos. It's no coincidence that Earth has two poles, just like a magnet. The molten iron in the center of Earth gives the planet its own magnetic field. The compass needle will line up with Earth's field and point to the north. The magnetic poles are not exactly the same as the geographic poles you see on a globe, but they are close. Scavenger hunt question number eight. When you are lost, you look at me. On my face, there is an S, W, N, and E. Only with magnetism will I point the right way. If you trust me, I won't lead you astray. It's what we just built, said Tim. A compass, of course, I said. I wrote, a compass uses a magnet to show which way is north. Animal Magnetism by Phoebe. People have always wondered how birds and sea animals know which way to migrate in the winter. Sometimes animals travel thousands of miles and they always know exactly where to go. Scientists think they may feel Earth's magnetic field. Tiny pieces of magnetite have been found in certain creatures such as bees and butterflies. The animals may be living compasses. Chapter 9 Hey, before we take off for the other side of the building, we should read the next riddle, I said to the rest of the class. Scavenger hunt question number nine. Deep inside a VCR and TV, there are many magnets to be found. How do magnets play a part in recording tapes of sight and sound? Tapes of sight and sound? Wanda asked, like movies? You're probably right, Wanda, Tim said. Let's think about it while we're on the move. We took off, thinking about how magnets might record tapes. It was a really tough question. As we ran down the hall, we came to an intersection. The needle showed us we needed to keep going straight. As we ran down the hall, we could see the door to Mr. O'Neatley's class ahead. By the time we got there, we were panting. We stood in the doorway and looked inside. At the front of the classroom, a videotape was playing. Hey, our scavenger riddle, D.A. exclaimed. Put on these magnet detecting glasses and tell me what you see, said the frizz. She was handing out sets of dark glasses. I put mine on and looked inside Mr. O'Neatley's classroom. On all the desks were bright, neat green shapes. The bright green things must be magnets, I exclaimed. I'll give you a green light for that, said the frizz. Look at the video, said Wanda. The entire TV set was covered in bright green. The television set and VCR had bunches of green blobs in them too. Stacked on top of the VCR were several videotapes, and they were green as well. Wow, said Ralphie, are, all, are those all magnets? Yes, magnets are used to power the speakers and the motor, and they also create the pictures on the screen, explained the frizz. So are TV sets magnetic, asked D.A.A.? Televisions contain about two pounds of magnets, which make them rather attractive, joked the frizz. But what about the tapes? What is the answer to the riddle? I asked. Miss Frizzle continued. All the sound and the pictures are stored in billions of tiny magnets that are stuck in the tape. That's great, I said. I wrote, videotape is magnetic. The picture and sound are stored on magnets in the tape. The video in Mr. O'Neatley's room was explaining compasses. Great, Wanda whispered. They must still be behind us. We're almost done. Okay, then, said the frizz. We need to answer the last question and get back to the science lab, or Mr. O'Neatley's class will win. What a repelling idea, I said. The thought of Mr. O'Neatley's class winning again made us all nervous. At that moment, we heard something dreadful. Okay, class, said Mr. O'Neatley. We've answered all the questions we can. Let's proceed in an orderly fashion to the science lab. 
We flattened ourselves back against the hallway walls as we heard the sound of chairs being pushed back and giant footsteps approaching the door. We were still so small. How would we ever catch up? Chapter 10. As soon as Mr. O'Neatley's class had filed out the door, the first said, Carlos, do you have the list? I waved it in the air. The first pointed towards the science lab and said, then let's go. The last answer is at the science lab. We started down the hall, and as we ran, we felt ourselves getting bigger. As soon as we reached our full size, we rounded the corner and caught up with Mr. O'Neatley's class. Wait a minute, Mr. O'Neatley called out loudly. Remember, no running in the halls. He didn't look happy to see us. I stopped running and started walking as fast as I could. Someone was keeping pace with me. It was Andrew. His mouth was shut tight and his eyebrows were pulled down over his eyes. We rounded the other corner. Andrew and I were in front of the crowd, still neck and neck. Nobody was saying a word, and I could hear Andrew start to breathe hard. Then I saw the science lab. Faster, faster, I thought. We were so close to finally beating Mr. O'Neatley's class. Andrew and I came to a stop in front of the science lab door. It was closed, but my hand was first on the knob. I turned it. It was locked. I rattled the knob, but it did no good. Here, let me, said Andrew, pushing my hand aside. He tried to open the door, but it still wouldn't budge. It's locked, he said, looking at me with surprise. I shrugged. I guess we can't get in, said Mr. O'Neatley with a chuckle. He and the frizz looked at each other, and I saw him wink. They knew it would be locked. They were up to something. There must be a way, I said to Andrew. I began feeling around the edges of the door. He got down on his knees and looked under the door. There's something there, he said. It's the key. There's something there, he said. I got down next to him. It's a key, I said. But how do we get it, he asked. We looked at each other. That's when I remembered there was still one riddle left. We looked at the last question on our scavenger hunt list. Final scavenger hunt task. You are almost done, but you have come to a closed door. If you can use your magnet logic, you'll find pizza and soda and more. We need a magnet, we said at the same time. Anyone have a magnet? I asked the crowd of kids behind us. Someone passed a bar magnet forward. I gently slid the magnet under the door and felt a ping as the key stuck to it. I pulled out the magnet and held it up to Andrew. He removed the key from the magnet. It fit right into the lock, and together we pushed the door open and stepped into the lab. The tables were covered with hot pizzas. I guess it's a tie, said Andrew with a smile. I smiled back. We just have to have a joint pizza party, said Mr. O'Neatley. Andrew and I shook hands, and behind us both classes cheered. We'd finally won something, well, tied, and it was be even more fun to eat pizza with Mr. O'Neatley's class. Hey, what's that on the refrigerator? Miss Frizzle asked Mr. O'Neatley. Oh, just some bus toy found on the floor, said Mr. O'Neatley. He looked embarrassed. I was going to put it in the lost and found, he said, heading toward the miniature magic school bus. Actually, that's mine, said Miss Frizzle. She plucked the tiny bus off the refrigerator door and gave Mr. O'Neatley a big smile. Thank you so much for finding it for me. I know I can always trust you to tidy up. Mr. O'Neatley looked proud. Carlos's scavenger hunt list. Scavenger hunt question number one. A magnet picks me up. A magnet holds me high. I'm not paper, wood, or rubber. I'm not plastic. What am I? Answer. Metals that contain iron and steel stick to magnets. Scavenger hunt question number two. We look the same as rocks, but we don't act the same. We are natural magnets. Can you guess our name? Answer. Magnetite is a rock that is a natural magnet. Scavenger hunt question number three. Not all magnets start on the ground. Not all magnets have to be found. When you can do this very easy chore, you can use one magnet to make many more. Answer. If you stroke a needle with a magnet... In one direction, the needle will become a magnet. Scavenger hunt question number four. When a magnet is in close range, the inside of some metals will change. The domains all turn to point the same way, and while the magnet is close, that's how they'll stay. Answer. Magnetic domains have their mole molecules 
lined up to create magnetic fields. Scavenger hunt question number five. We're in each magnet, here is your big clue. One is north, one is south, together we are two. What are we? Answer, magnets have two poles, north on one end and south on the other. Ma scavenger hunt, question number six. These magnets work with electric power. You can turn them off and on. They make a motor run for hours, but with no electricity, their power is gone. Answer, the kind of magnet that uses electric current and creates motors is an electromagnet. Scavenger hunt question number seven. Magnets can run motors, but you know that is not all. With these special boots and gloves, they help workers climb the wall. Answer, workers climb steel walls wearing industrial grippers. Scavenger hunt question number eight. When you're lost, you look at me. On my face, there is an S, W, N, and E. Only with magnetism will I point the right way. If you trust me, I won't lead you astray. Answer, a compass uses a magnet to show which way is north. Scavenger hunt question number nine. Deep inside a VCR and TV, there are many magnets to be found. How do magnets play a part in recording tapes of sight and sound? Answer, videotape is magnetic. The picture and sound are stored on magnets on the tape.